as we head back to the fucking car, he was like, shotgun, he takes the front seat. So I was sitting in the back seat, uh, and I should have been in the front seat, because I was the new funny friend, and all of a sudden they had a newer, younger, funnier friend, also thinner. So I'm sitting, I'm sitting in the back of the car, he's sitting in the front seat, he's driving, Walter's sitting next to me, and the whole ride up, the little kid is just like, snooch to the news, snooch to the all the shit you've seen in the movies. And these two dudes are like, ha, 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 laughing their heads off. And I'm sitting in the back going like, this shit is too fucking funny. <laughs> Snooch. <laughs> what the fuck's that mean? Snooch, what kind of idiot would say that? Now I call my company Snoogans Inc. Uh, so we're driving up to the show in, in New York. We go up there with Little Boy Muse. And he didn't have any loot or anything like that. Uh, but we'd give him a few bucks to buy like little books out of a quarter box or something like that. And so at the show, there were two vendors, particularly. Do you remember who they were? Uh, it would be uh, Blachi and Cha-Chain. Blachi was a guy that had what? Had so was Blachi, uh, yeah, he had a, a weird, I mean, looking back, it wasn't really nice to call him Blachi. <laughs> Dad! Uh, looking back, it, it probably wasn't that nice to call him Blachi, but he was, in all fairness, Blachi, like red patch here, red patch here. And yeah, it was like super dry, patches of skin all over his body. Um, and then Cha-Ching was a dude who uh, worked with his mom, right? His, his, I mean, this is a guy who was probably 50, his mom looked like to be 80, and uh, he wore short shorts, um, a bandana, uh, and I have a bandana, a fucking headband. I had a bandana, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, like, uh, like an 80s style <laughs> old, like sweatband, and uh, had one of those ice cream man change makers on his belt. And uh, it was fantastic. I think it was fantastic, I thought, the little change thing, or was it just too? Yeah, it, 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 fantastic, <laughs> I fantastic if you're like, I love low tech. You know, basically, <laughs> a little machine that didn't give out change and whatnot. So these cats would sit there, vend comics, Blachi and Cha-Ching were their nicknames. And so we'd send news over there, like, go ask Cha-Ching, try to get a cheap comic or something like that. And he would try to haggle with them and then say weird stuff to them. So the whole ride home, these two dudes, Brian and, and uh, Walter, are sitting in the car. And in the beginning of the ride, like from you know Manhattan to where we live, it's about an hour, hour, five minutes. The moment we get in the car and we're driving, they start fucking needling Jay. Like on the ride up, he was the hero, man. Little kid saying weird, funny shit. On the ride back, like Walter Flanagan and Brian Johnson just sat there and they're like, you wanted to suck Blotchy's dick, didn't you? <laughs> and he's like, what? Yeah, I did. Like in the beginning, it was just like, yeah, I did. I'd eat it right up. And then, like, and then rather than fucking let it go and shit, the boys just kept going. They're like, I bet you'd eat it right up. <laughs> We didn't give you enough money for all those comics. How'd you get them? <laughs> it was just a running monologue about how Muse had fucking filleted and sodomized everyone in the comic books. <laughs> like he's, he's hiding in a long box with the lid on it. Why don't you pull it up, pop it in his mouth, and throw it back to him? The most random stuff it was. But, and I even tried to join in, I remember. I was like, yeah, and then I was under the table and I popped out and he'd be like, oh, and then there was this, and they like, started talking over this, and then all of a sudden I was like, you yeah. know the way the wind moves, what else tell it? It really was, and, but I still had fun. It was memorable, very memorable. And Walt doesn't seem like that guy anymore, like you, see, like you hear Walt on and tell him Steve Dave, or you see Walt on the show, and it, it doesn't, it, it's hard to imagine him just like truly diving into the spirit of ridiculing uh, an underage kid for uh, giving oral sex to one man five times his age. Or just the, <laughs> just the idea of him going like, let's take a kid in the car across state lines. Like, he would never do that really? anymore, but back then he was just like, let's. In fact, he did, if he hadn't done it, there would be eventually no fucking Jay and Silent Bob, no clerks. I mean, as much as like, Brian was the guy who made me want to write Randall and whatnot. I, there was no Jay without Jay. It wasn't like I wrote that part and I was like, let's find the perfect little idiot to play. <laughs> I knew the perfect little idiot and they just put him right in the fucking script. So it, it was, I don't know, it was fucking bonding memories. Whenever I think about Comic Cons and us, that's what I think about. It's like, that's where we all kind of got tight with one another. By the time we got home, that whole fucking ride back from the Comic Con, in the beginning he was kind of like, this is funny, you guys are funny, and trying to join in. But about half an hour into the ride, he just shut down. Like, Jason just stopped talking and started reading comics in the back. And fucking Walter and Brian were just sitting there still going for an hour long about how much dick he was sucking. And 
Jason was not even responding anymore. No, no more. Yeah, man, I'm eating dick. He's just looking at his comments. And so they would make a joke and look back at the driving his fuckers driving the car. And he'd be like, yeah, man, you're eating a lot of fucking dick. And I'm going into another plane. And he didn't even react. He just kind of fucking shut down. It was so sad to see him. And then when we got to where we were going, we were like, bye, Jay. He was like, all right, bye, guys. <laughs> Bright and sunny again, but what were you thinking for that whole half hour? Well, I, I got the ball again. It started. It started getting where I want. I thought it was funny. I was cracking up, trying to join in, but then it just kept going. They, Walter and Brian, just kept going to where I'm like, this is. Not, it's funny still, but it's not necessarily fun anymore. I can't be part of it, and I'm just a butt of the joke. So I just sort of tuned out. I was very excited about my books because that was the first show I went to that wasn't. You know, a, a little local town a comic book show is my first convention. And it also pushed me, what I was thinking is, if you noticed after that, where I used to be like, I used to like go to Bry's house and knock on his door, or go to the community center and harass Walter, I stopped doing that, and that's when I started knocking at your door and being like, hey, what are you doing today? I was, <laughs> like, I was like, you don't understand, we're not friends. <laughs> Share friends, and that's great. But like when our our linchpin friends are not around, we're not really friends. It's an awkward fucking pairing. You'd be like, okay, so what are we gonna do today? He's like, don't you? And then he was having a call like to warehouse, and then call like down the road and shit. And they were like, well, in, in Naples they've got one. And we're like, Naples, where is that? And we're, like, we're gonna go down the highway. And he's like, you might pass. He's like, okay. So we're driving today. And we leave uh, St. Petersburg, and it's like supposed to be a four, four and a half hour ride. It took us eight hours to get here, because all we did was stop at every Target along the way. Now, like, it wasn't so bad that like I'm wearing this shirt and people are like, it's that fucking dude who got thrown off the plane! But, you know, I was wearing like a like black zip up thing and shit, but we were talking about it. it's crazy. Like even if I'm when I'm in the colors, it's easy to recognize. When people are like, oh, there's that guy, that shaped guy who's in those colors. They don't know my name, but they're like, I've seen him wear that shirt on television, so they kind of have an idea who you are. If I take this off, it's like Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. <laughs> And suddenly I disappear and I blend into the crowd, man. Like, if I walked into the center of the crowd right now, dipped below their heads, took this off and sat down, you'd never find me again. Right? So essentially, you know, I, I'm, I'm wearing the black thing, so I figure I'm kind of invisible, but they made us right away. Like, first, I guess they see a big dude, and they're like, hey, maybe it's, it, it, he's got a beard. That guy with a beard. It's either every man in America or that guy. <laughs> So they make me and shit, and then when he comes in right behind her, he comes over, he's like, look at this. Suddenly they're like, he's the thin one, he's the foul one, holy shit, it's that! Why do they have 12 folks? <laughs> why, why are they in homewares? And, and so the one we stopped at, man, like, fucking, he races through the front, door, almost like he's fucking bursting it down to save burning children inside of it. Bam! Comes through the fucking door, goes racing for housewares and shit. I'm looking at every other end cap and aisle because we start finding more different JLA shit, not just the rugs and shit. They're just making all this stuff, like all this little plates, bowls, cups, cool shit. Gardening tools. Yes. Gardening tools. He got so excited, he was like, look, they make Batman gardening tools. I was like, do you garden? He's like, no, but I start. <laughs> So we're meeting every Target employee there is, man, because he's harassing everyone, going, where the rugs, where the rugs? Can you call somebody and find out where the rugs are? And they're like, I'm sure I don't know what you mean, sir. Because in his mind, he's like, the rugs, we've had this conversation, this is the JLA rugs. But you can't walk up to a stranger and have them assume that you mean the JLA rugs and shit. But he would do that. He'd go right up to a Target employee and be like, where the rugs? And he's like, I, what do you mean? <laughs> Like, like a dude talking to him must be like, why the fuck does he need a rug that bad? <laughs> um, so we, we spent a lot of time going to fucking targets and whatnot. We bought so much, so much JLA-based merchandise that we then also had to buy a suitcase at Target <laughs> to bring it home with us. So suddenly we go shopping for a suitcase and like, you know, there's a standard size, like this will get us back, but then we're like, well, if we get this, what if we get more shit? There's a Target on the way home and shit. So we're like, let's get the biggest bag possible. So we get the bag and our, our cart is full of fucking JLA merchandise and we pull it up to check out. As we're checking it out, he's going very complicated. Rather than simply saying, hey, we're going to put all our merch in this suitcase, he was just like, okay, 
I'm going to need to pay for this bag first, because after I pay for this bag, what you're going to do is check all these items out, and then when that is done, these are gonna, like step-by-step -step instructions. <laughs> to somebody who looked like, you know, they were older than us, and just like, dude, I've been around, I understand you're going to carry your shit in your bag. So we opened up the piece of luggage, checked everything out, threw it in, and he wheeled it out into the car. That's how much crap we bought to that. Uh, but it was just like old home week. It was like fucking like a certain point as we were racing into a department store going, do you have something that's very exclusive, superhero oriented, or comic book? It took us right back to fucking the period, man, of looking for the Greedo dolls. It was kind of sweet. So we it took a real walk down memory lane uh, on our way here. But to the, it, it got to the ridiculous point where they were talking about there's this one target, it's fucking someplace else. Like, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to say Key West, but it was way the fuck down there or something like that. The last Target in America. <laughs> right before we had to go to Target in Cuba. Um, um, so, so he's like, should we do it? Should we change our fucking flight so that we can go to this Target tomorrow afternoon? And I was like, you need help, dude. Like, I said, we could go to California and we'd go to Targets all over California. Go on, go drive. He's like, we should do that. And so we put in our calendars a date to go hunting for JLA roads in, uh, in, in California. But anybody around here, if you're remotely interested in this very cool four quadrant JLA road that only Target makes, get there fucking fast. Before this dude gets here. Awesome breakfast tray, too. The breakfast tray. Oh, that's fantastic. It's a JLA breakfast tray, man. You can your breakfast served in bed with fucking Batman and Superman. Uh, within a half hour, it gets pretty hot in that room, and I show up like a half hour late, and I was really tired, and, and I come in, and his energy level, his pep, his excitement, his enthusiasm, I just want to fucking knock him the fuck out. And I swear to God, it's just, he's... He's too hammy. He's he's too excited. He, you know, somebody's like, "You're gonna get your picture." All right, all right, let's go. I like clapping. Come on, let's do it. I love this. I love that. If, if I hear one more thing that he loves, man, aside from his family, uh, which he never says he loves because he's never around, um, it, it's it, it's I don't know. It annoys me sometimes. It really does. Yeah. So the dude comes to work with a good attitude. You're like fucking jerk. Yeah. I know. I know it sounds weird, but he's a little bit jerky in that respect. <laughs> Um, what was that, Sega? Well, it's Am I wearing a Merkin? <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> My shit's falling out. I need to put a pew toupee down there. <laughs> um, but, uh, he also, like, we did at first, we. I only had a couple things to do, and because I saw comics, my gaming's podcast that they do. Uh, had set up interviews, I guess, and I found out what, here at the con. Yes, yeah, so at the con. Yeah, it, like they were uh, in a room, and it was the I saw comics panel. It was like two hours blocked off of, uh, all three days, and I found out uh, through my confidential sources that I, initially I was banned from the uh, from the podcast. I wasn't allowed to join in. Well, I can see why, because you're like I hate a guy that has enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> You know, in retrospect, maybe he wasn't totally off, but uh, yeah, they, they were afraid uh, that I was going to derail them and make fun of them and you know, ruin their interviews, which mission accomplished. <laughs> what did you do? What's that? What did you do? I just, I ridiculed them and mocked them <laughs> in front of their guests and humiliated them. Uh, no, I mean, I joined in, but I, I truly, like, I'm not even kidding around. There is, like, I'm concerned for me. As when he, I don't know if you ever noticed it, because he does do it sometimes during the, the podcast portions of the TV show. Um, if somebody goes on for even like two minutes, something comes over his face and he starts staring and he doesn't respond to anything. It's almost like he's in a trance. He probably just forgets that he's on camera. Like it's not, he's never been trained for it. He was never like, I, I gotta know when the camera's on me or whatnot. He doesn't really think about the editing process. He just gets lost in the conversation. Like he's actually enjoying what you're saying. No, it's not me talking. He's doing the interview. I think when I'm talking about the podcast, there's no camera in anything. So when we're sitting, it would be like this, and he's sitting in the room, and he asks um, Alan Bergman, is that his name? Alan, like old? No, I'm sorry. Alan Bellman, the uh, Captain America guy. He asks him a question, and then like a minute in, things like this. 
and not responding to anything uh, the guy says. And, and he's an old dude, so he's going on and on and on. And I literally texted him. I was like, are you going to interrupt him at any point? He's like, he and this other guy. Who's the other guy? Al Plastinum? They start bickering. And at the best moment, though, the best moment, it was like these two old guys that kind of had like a little comedy bit going. But the best moment is the, the first guy, Alan Bellman, is talking about somebody that he knows back in 1942, and he says, um, you know, he's, he's given a little bit of information about this guy, I guess he was an artist or something, and he goes, you know, and, you know, he, he fell on hard times, you know, he, he murdered a woman in a hotel room, and, you know, he had to pay for that, and, yeah, that's what I was like, <laughs> did he just say anything he said? Maybe she has no reaction to it at all, so now, so now I'm questioning myself, and, and the crowd, when he says it, sort of like, chuckles like uncomfortably and, and, and he, he then chides the audience he says he goes like hey, it's not funny he, he was a good man you know and he, he didn't deserve the treatment that he got never saying like he didn't murder the lady <laughs> so you have to assume that he was guilty but i guess uh no one thought that maybe he was uh, over punished a little bit and uh May never really recovered. And, 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 and he did the same thing. Do you think he was just scared inside? Like, oh my god. <laughs> He's taking a life. Like, this, this is how it is. <laughs> um, I, I, I told Mike, I said, dude, you've got to take lead on these interviews from now on. Mike, he was something from He was like an organic brain disease or something. <laughs> I don't know what you can do. He did the same thing with Lloyd Kaufman, like, at a certain, uh, from trauma. Really nice guy. Yeah, that's what he is. Really nice guy. And uh, Nate asked one question. He's like, so what are you working on now? And like 15 minutes later, he hadn't said another word. <laughs> the Art of the Interview by Ming Chen. Yeah. yeah. Did he just like in his head, he's like, I don't fucking care, man. I'm on TV. And I'm fucking gonna fucking be so huge, man. You got to in front of a camera right now. Yeah, I don't fucking care what you're saying, really, man. I'm just doing this shit. It drives Walter crazy. If you think I'm bad, it drives Walter crazy. Walter what? Steve, I'm bad. Yeah. So I wrote the script, it's 120 pages, submitted that, three different budgets for three different states. Uh, the cast list, the schedule for when we're shooting, gave it to Bob Weinstein on Monday, the meeting tomorrow will be two weeks ago. He's got one month to kind of pull it together and make a decision whether he wants to do it or not. If he doesn't want to do it, we get to take it out and do it. I might finance it myself and stuff. Anyway, so I submitted the package and we're waiting around for a response. And you know, I've been in this position before where I haven't been in in a few years, and the world of podcasting, what's beautiful about it, and I encourage you all to try this, because it's fun as fuck, sit down with a friend and start having some conversation, but the world of podcasting, you get an idea, you sit down in front of a microphone, boom, you blurt it out, you're done, you move on. The next day, you do something completely fucking different. There's nimble mobility, you can move around. When you're going to somebody like, I need millions of dollars to make a movie, naturally the wheels of creativity grind to a kind of slower halt as people make weighty decisions about that's a lot of money, will we make our money back? So in that process, you find yourself like amped up to go, but then you're kind of idling on the starting line. So many times in the past, I've done this with other movies that I was trying to put together, and like on Clerks 2, we submitted the script, it took six months before they were like, okay, you guys can go. And that's that's kind of tough, so I decided early on, like, keep yourself busy, do other shit. So Zach and Mary make a porno when I submitted that script, um, and we had to wait for a response, and still sit around and wait. I said, fuck it, I'll just start writing something else. I had this thing in my head that I wanted to get out. I said, maybe I'll try writing that. And I did, and it was Red State. And we went on to make that. <laughs> so as I'm sitting here waiting for the news on Clerks 3, I'm starting to get antsy again when I'm starting to wake up and look at the phone and like, when's he going to call and shit like that? And I don't want to get into that place. Like, I, I, there are so many other things to be doing. I could busy myself with that. But I realized that it was like the best way to kill fucking time is to just write another script. So I was just like, you know, I like that walrus thing. <laughs> so I sat down and I started writing. And how I got there was like, I knew I couldn't call it the walrus and the carpenter. It seemed a little too on the nose. A lot of people on Twitter were like, call it I am the walrus. That's even more on the nose. But then I thought, ooh, I could call it Tusk, you know? Because they got 
fucking Tusk, and so I said, I'm gonna get in the mood, and I fucking pulled up uh, Fleetwood Max Tusk on my iTunes and stuff, and just started playing it over and over again. Like, I just played it all day long and started writing, it was the white noise in my whole day, just under everything I did was do, 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 all that shit. I looked here, you can look on your iTunes thing, it tells you how many times you played something, 108 times. I played it in a row and kept writing, and I now have 55 pages of a, of a screenplay called Tusk. saying like we're gonna do it and shit but I figure like sometimes you gotta follow it through exercise the demon creativity man uh, you get inspired to do stuff that lives inside you like a fucking little demon and it's always poking at the back of your head do it do it but make me come to life and shit so it's nice to be able to kind of like do this to take it back um for the Tusk movie who did you have in mind to play uh Gregory the Lords? Who do I have to have in mind to play? The Lords. The wall, the guy. Um, well, I mean, during the podcast, it was all about Scott, like the lodger, we call him. So, you know, and during the podcast, I was like, Scott, you should fucking do this, man, because weird things could happen. You could wind up being the next McMillan and wife or some such shit. If you wind up in this fucking flick, like, you could launch an acting career. So he was game on the podcast, but when I fucking told him on iChat the other night, it was going back like a week ago, um, he was like, what are you up to? And I said, uh, here, I'll show you. And I copied a little piece of the script and sent it to him in iChat, and he was like, no fucking way. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go for it. And he goes, you're fucking kidding. And he was, he was like, we were joking. And I was like, you were joking. Yeah. I know a good idea when I smell it. So, um, I don't know, Scott has got this very exciting thing in the offing right now. He's working on uh, this big cartoon movie called Free Birds, which comes out in Thanksgiving. It's a turkey cartoon movie. Turkey's traveling through town. Um, he might be getting a different uh, gig after that, an even cooler gig than that, so he's kind of keeping his docks clear, so I don't know if I'll be able to convince him to play the lodger. If that's the case, then the sky's the limit, and I can kind of go anywhere. We joked about it on the podcast, like, let's get James Franco. He does weird fucking shit all the time. He'd love to play a walrus, but that seems like a little bit too on, on the nose. Like, people will be like, of course James Franco's in it. He's a walrus, you know? So, I want to go a little bit outside the box. Somebody last night was like, let it be Muse, but I'm Muse is in it, just not as that guy. Brian yeah, can do Bruce it. Willis, absolutely. <laughs> oh my God, if anyone would want to step into a walrus suit, it would be me. It would just make him public and make it lovable, finally. I would hug him and shit. Like that. Um, but, uh, but I'm not quite sure. Like, on the podcast, we talked about maybe John Cusack at one point. Like, but these were all things before I thought about it as a real flip. So I don't, I don't know. As we get closer, I'll let you know. But there's nobody, I'm not writing for anyone in my head right now, except for Parks as the guy who is. Go ahead.